So I hope the screen is visible to all of you. And uh, we begin. So techniques of preserving fungal stalks. So we do have a lot of uh, cultures that are uh, isolated from patient samples. We also get many samples, uh, many uh, good fungi when we are participating in EQUAS or we are having an internal quality assurance scheme when we are having external quality assurance scheme. So all these things are very important. These isolates are very, very important. At the same time, we have a lot of ATCC strains also with us. So when we have so many uh, stocks with us, we are bothered of how to maintain them because we actually uh, like to keep those stocks and we want to keep them. Uh, they have to be revived. They have to maintain with all their properties. We don't want them to be losing any of the property. So it is a big challenge. So frankly speaking, we have a lot of cultures and um, I am sharing this information on a personal basis saying that uh, whatever isolates we do get at Ames Bhopal, we, and if they are something unique or something different, we give them a number, a, a stock number, and we maintain those stocks for years together. At the same time, if it is for the equas, we are participating with PGI Chandigarh. So whenever they're giving us any cultures, so we preserve those cultures also because they give us the confirmed identification. And if it comes out to be right or wrong, it is not a big botheration for us. We are trying to improvise every day. So marks don't matter. But those cultures or drift controls are very important because when you are suspecting any such similar organism, you have one control which was identified correctly to your reference for phenotypic identification or for genotypic. So you have some references to which you always can go back and consult your present clinical sample isolate or any other isolate. At the same time, we do procure some ATCC strains and we need to revive and we need, we need to maintain them for long for performing AFST, for performing routine uh, identification methods. Also for yesterday, you have learned about the therapeutic drug monitoring where there was description of this and Antonio strain, Canada Kefir. So we have a lot of actually cultures which need to be preserved well. And when you have uh, rare fungi coming up uh, at your centers, it, you really are uh, very positive about them and you want to preserve them so that it is your academic uh, treasure. You want to show it to your students, you want to show it during your trainings, you want to preserve those. So definitely fungal culture stocks is a very delicate matter and it needs a lot of effort. So we have been doing it by the uh, short term. There are some short term methods and there are some long term methods of preservation. So short term methods of preservation are something which you can, you have, you, it is easy to perform, but long term methods are some which actually facilitate you for a long term preservation. But the, there are some merits and demerits with everything. So we will try to discuss those. Okay. So today's objectives include the need to preserve the fungal cultures, the methods of preservation, and the pros and cons of various preservation methods. So what is the need to preserve the fungal organisms or the cultures? Maintaining standard strains. So you always are in need of standard strains, which are your reference strains. And teaching and for academic purposes, let it be undergraduates, postgraduates, for any other uh, academic reasons, we require good strains which have been identified and which have all the properties which can be demonstrated to the students and can be taught well. At the same time, you want to preserve stocks to create a repository for research. So you get so many isolates which you think are very good and they may be, they have, uh, they have uh, very good characteristics, maybe drug resistant strains, or you want some specific uh, candida species, or you want specific aspergillus species, or any other uh, melanized fungi, whichever fungi you want to uh, uh, undergo research, you want, you're deciding that I'll perform molecular tests later on. So they, you want to create a repository. So for creating this repository, again, you need to maintain or preserve these fungal organisms with all their properties. You don't want them to lose any of the properties. And some of the good mucor, if suppose in, uh, there is an example, we have uh, we have got some histoplasma species, we have got some sporotrix, we have got some um, uh, rare uh, like Saxena vesiformis, which is actually very difficult to maintain. 
So these organisms are all very challenging. At the same time, there are a lot of Canada species which are again uh, with lot of variations, Canada oris and other tropicalis and lots of species, parapsilosis. You have a lot of fungal species which you want uh, to study and your requirement of research is very different. So you have the only basic thing that you require is the stocks. So for epidemiological and clinical purposes also, you want to go back to your isolate, perform an AFST or perform it in some other molecular method on that isolate to reconfirm whether it was the same or not. So for that reason, again, you require or you have to go back to your stocks. So another important area where it is still under process is research, vaccine and diagnostic kit developments. So in those cases also, you require a treasure of your um, cultures. So we're not concerned in this aspect, but yes, there are people who preserve for this reason and to um, and to act and to know uh, that this is a bioterrorism uh, act and you have you want to know what isolate it is. So people do preserve that those isolates and those uh, have to be identified. So these are some of the some are positive what needs and there is some negative need also so where many many countries or their approach is that so effective preservation properties so what are the effective preservation properties what technique are you doing and what are your expectations from that technique most of the times in our laboratory what we perform is either you want to inoculate the yeast in the canada either it is a semi solid or uh, you want to inoculate in the butts, you use glycerol stock method, you use uh, distilled water method. So there are, uh, you, you can use mineral oil overlay methods. So there are a lot of methods that are available, but there are some merits and demerits with each and every method. Our expectation with the preserved, uh, when we try to preserve our stocks is they should be viable. Whenever uh, I'm trying to subculture, I want to grow it back, it should be viable. It should not be contaminated and their phenotypic and genotypic property should be preserved and it should be recovered from same conditions prior to preservation i should not need some extra effort to recover that organism after preservation so if i don't if i want some very different conditions again my entire process or entire work that i have done to preserve this isolate it actually uh, it makes my workload increase if I'm trying to uh, recover it through some different modality. So these are some of the uh, properties that every individual or every mycologist would like to have when they want to preserve the fungi. So primary methods of culture preservation are, there are some continuous growth method, drying and freezing. So in, in all our labs, what we follow is the continuous growth method. Drying and freezing is when we, we usually opt it for some of the species, not for all the genus or all the fungi. We don't do drying and freezing method. So predominantly what we choose is the continuous growth method. Now, what is continuous growth method? The cultures are grown on agar. These are short term storage. Cultures are stored at temperatures around five to minus 20 degrees centigrade. These methods are simple and inexpensive and because specialized equipment is not required. So what you do is you have a regular chart of subcultures so you are doing, you are growing them. You are again after a particular period is over of, of, of around two months to three months and you take it out and you try to subculture again. So this is how your cultures are grown. So it is a continuous growth that you are trying to maintain. So this is fine. We can, we are processing. We don't lose much of the property by that. But there are issues that when you're doing your continuous growth and there is a chance of your fungus getting uh, contaminated, you lose them. You don't have a long, long preserved um, thing which you or another set with you. So you, there is a chance that you lose your fungus, the control fungus. Second method is drying. Drying is the most useful method of preservation for cultures that produce spores. So for spores uh, like silica gel glass, uh, be, glass bead soil like sand sand or soil is again something which people use for drying and fungi have been stored successfully up to 11 years there have been records where people have demonstrated 11 years up to 11 years they could store the fungi on silica gel so again drying methods are simple and also they are not they do not require expensive equipment another important uh, method which we all try to follow that is freezing methods and cryopreserva cryopreservation these are versatile and widely applicable and most fungi can be preserved with or without cryoprotectants in liquid nitrogen or in standard home freezers audible yeah. okay so 
what we are trying to do is uh, whenever we are trying to preserve so freezing freezing methods and cryo preservation is such that you want to go with cryo protectants or many times uh, many labs process them uh, or preserve them without cryo protectants so when you are doing without cryo protectants um, there is some issue uh, when you want to revive it but when you are doing it with cryo protectants again it helps you but again it is not so uh, it becomes expensive definitely when you have to put something extra that becomes expensive so with freeze drying or lyophilization uh, the fungal cultures are frozen and subsequently dried under vacuum so freeze drying or lyophilization are those techniques fundamentally you have to freeze them first at at very uh, at very low temperatures somewhere it should be between uh, minus 20 also people freeze but minus 80 minus 20 or minus 80 whichever you feel is comfortable but they have to be frozen after frozen you have to subsequently dry them through vacuum so that is what you are doing with the freeze drying or lyophilization and then you can keep it in your refrigerator four degrees centigrade the method is highly successful with cultures that produce the mitospores so where the sporulation is good they produce a lot of mitospores so in those cases it is successful but you cannot do it for each and every uh, fungus they are, you, it is not possible even for lyophilization and freeze drying and freezing below minus 135 degree are excellent methods for permanent preservation and they are highly recommended the only disadvantage with these freezing methods include the specialized and expensive equipments now the methods of preservation could be short term preservation or the long term preservation when you look at the short term preservation that is serial transfer of cultures from one tube to the other over a particular period time period so maintenance of culture up to 6 months to 1 year is possible through this technique after that you are little dissatisfied with the subcultures that you get from the serial transfer of cultures many can be revived some lose their characteristics so you are worried you want to go ahead with the long term preservation at this moment so storage temperature is somewhere around 4 to 20 degree uh, minus 20 degree centigrade so this is what is the temperature what you are choosing for the serial transfer of cultures now what are the advantages of short term preservation it is simplest you have one technical support a person who is doing your routine laboratory work so they can maintain this uh, serial transfer of cultures there is no cry protecting needed no costly equipment no further training to run a freeze drying machine this is good but the disadvantage is again the individual who is performing it it requires again lot of effort as well as time consuming because you have to check every time which cultures you have subculture now which again i have to serially transfer in next month so this again is labor intensive time consuming and it is not suitable for long term preservation and sometimes you may not revive or sporulate many fungus they don't they only will show hyphal forms they may not revive well and most of the times if we are not very careful and some of the cultures we have just kept and we forgot to see after three months or four months we find them to be infested with mites if they're not stored properly at proper temperature so fungus is something that if we, it has a chance that uh, it gets infected with the mites so what are the various methods of long-term preservation the long-term preservation methods include oil overlay immersion in distilled water organic substances soil or sand freezing lyophilization and liquid nitrogen oil overlay is low cost and low maintenance method you have to sterilize the oil which you are using and it can be preserved for several years at room temperature or 15 to 20 degrees centigrade it is appropriate and you will find mycelial or non-sporulating fungi that is the filamentous fungi oil overlay is very good technique and it reduces because of the presence of oil there is not much mite infestations so oil overlay is preferred for the uh, for the filamentous fungi so what is the process of the oil overlay high quality mineral oil has to be chosen like you are using olive oil or other oils in case of um, your melasesia but here you have to use high quality mineral oil and it has to be entrapped uh, and it, all moisture should be removed it should be very nicely covered now fungal cultures and agar slant they are covered you have a slant where there is a growth so you simply have to pour this uh, high quality mineral oil and it is called as an overlay it should be uh, covering at least 10 mm with the oil that means uh, not, no portion of the growth should be visible it should be completely covered with the oil uh, it, nothing should be like free from oil 
entire surface should be submerged in oil the tubes must be always kept upright position at room temperature you cannot keep on tilting them or you cannot disposition them because there is a chance that uh, the area where there is fungus is it has lost the overlay so you have to be very very careful now what are the problems with oil overlay oil level has to be checked periodically and if you find that it is reducing you have to increase problems are there in retrieving or reviving cultures from mineral oil and fungi they continue to grow and selection of mutants that can grow under adverse conditions because mineral oil if you are giving an overlay that is an adverse condition for the fungus so it can have some mutation in because of the stress or the adverse condition that you are providing mineral oil it has to be sterile and it is messy to work so that is another very important factor which actually discuss the ranges with the mineral oil so some labs have chosen to do it with the immersion in the distilled water so many fungi they can survive up to 7 years with the distilled water again what you require is sterile conditions you have to be very very uh, cautious about the sterile conditions and the tube should be completely sealed and it is a simple and inexpensive method but water suppresses also it suppresses some of the morphological changes so what you find is that is something that occurs and there will not be many morphological changes that you will find when you have preserved it in the distilled water there have been reports where people have suggested that around 90 to 95% of the fungi can sur survive in the in, uh, in distilled water immersion immersion in distilled water how do you do it inoculate the fungal strains on preferred media whichever media you are choosing and then incubate for several weeks at 25 degrees centigrade so that you induce the sporulation once the sporulation has been induced well you take sterile distilled water around 6 to 7 ml and uh, to the culture so this has to be very carefully done and if you do it with the inside a hood also it is good surface of the culture is scraped so you gently scrape the culture and with a pipe pit um, to produce a spore and mycelial slurry so usually you scrape it with the pipe pit okay pipe pit you can attach a tip also to that so pipe pit with the tip you push inside and you scrape it so once you have scraped and there is a uh, distilled water so you create a slurry of the spore as well as the filamentous forms now you take this slurry and put it in the cryovials once you have put this slurry you have just simply pour this slurry into the cryovial and store at 25 degrees centigrade so this is how you are doing with the immersion in the distilled water sometimes people also cut the culture material culture into small pieces from agar's land by straight loop and transfer these into cryovials containing distilled water so these are two techniques either you can choose to uh, work with the slurry or else you can cut the agar and you can put it in the distilled water so this is how people have reported storage of fungal isolates so the first one is the oil overlay where you can see the amount of oil that has been put there is uh, it's almost filling up the tube then second one is these are small cryovials where the slurry has been put and it is uh, preserved okay so this is something so this are actually if you can look at it they can be stored at 25 degrees centigrade so it's a room temperature so you are seeing that they are very much outside and they are preserved so both oil overlay and uh, distilled water they, this is how you can preserve now coming to the soil or sand uh, so some fungi they can be easily preserved and successfully maintained for many years in dry sterile soil or sand so here also the sand that you will be choosing you have to select uh, good quality sand and you have to actually sterilize it and then you can preserve in those but the problem is the dormancy caused by dryness and it can take time to develop so it becomes actually very dormant the fungus so soil or sand preservation of fungus uh, so glass bottles you have to take around 60 ml and they are filled to two, two thirds capacity you have to fill them with sand or the loamy soil where the water content is 20 percent and then you have to sterilize them by autoclaving for 20 minutes at 120 degrees centigrade so once you are uh, entire uh, so soil or the sand is sterilized in the bottle now the bottles are allowed to cool and then you again sterilize them so sterile distilled water is now added to the culture and again you are scraping the surface of the as you have done in case of the distilled water so and, and the colony surface is scraped gently to produce 5 ml of the spore or the mycelial suspension so your slurry again here is ready now 1 ml of this suspension is added to each bottle of soil or sand and after 12 to 14 days of growth at room temperature the bottles are stored in the refrigerator so after you are keeping them at room temperature and if you are finding any growth after 12 to 14 days of growth you refrigerate them now to revive the fungus a few grains of the soil are sprinkled onto fresh agar medium so you just have to take little bit of soil or sand and you have to sprinkle it on the agar plate 
So once you are sprinkling it, what will happen? If the spores are there, they will produce the uh, fung uh, they will produce the growth. Uh, either the it is preferably again it is done for the molds. This is a better technique for the molds which have got again good amount of spores, very good sporulating fungus. So we have very good sporulating fungus, the various aspergillus species. Okay, so mucorrhizae you can try preserving in this way, so it would help. Now coming to freezing, most fungal cultures frozen at minus 20 to minus 80 degrees centigrade in mechanical freezers. So we are discussing about the um, techniques with the oil overlay. Oil overlay, many centers do perform oil overlay. At the same time, they have glycerol overlay also. So or they put the agar into the glycerol and they keep it at minus 20. So that again, the oil is usually kept at um, room temperature, but glycerol uh, stock when you're doing, you are putting it into minus 20 or deep freezers. So most fungal cultures frozen at minus 20 to minus 80 degrees centigrade in the mechanical freezers, they remain viable for up to five years or more. And cultures grown on agar slants in bottles or test tubes with screw caps can be placed directly in the freezer. So you can grow them in the agar slants or tubes. So you can directly freeze them also. So that is another method. But when you are using the freezing technique, you're always uh, very much worried about the height uh, at very low temperatures or the ice crystals uh, trying to damage the cells, living cells. So because of living cells, they are damaged by repeated freezing and thawing. So you want to give some chemical cryoprotectants. Now, there are various types of chemical cryoprotectants, um, the penetrating agents as well as non-penetrating agents. When you have penetrating agents such as glycerol, that's why we feel this glycerol is so good because it readily passes through the cell membrane and protects intracellularly as well as extracellularly. So you can have glycerol, you can have DMSO. Whereas non-penetrating agents such as sucrose, lactose, glucose, mannitol, sorbitol, dextron, polyvinyl, pyrolidone, and hydroxyethyl starch, these also exert their protective effect, but they external to the cell membrane. They don't penetrate. So this is very important when you're trying to understand. And these components are also present when you are using a lifelization method. In lifelization or deep or the dry, dry freezing or the dry uh, freezing technique. So in the, that technique also you are using skimmed milk, or it is also known as the uh, sterile. It is it is it is something a combination of the uh, bovine serum albumin plus you are having some amount of lactose or sucrose, and you also add some other components to it. So it is called as a skimmed milk. Uh, what you are using. So many times people in lifelization or dried freezing that is the technique used. So freezing preservation of the fungus, the process, entire process is inoculate the fungal strain on preferred media and incubate up to resting phase. So you inoculated the fungus strain on the media and they have incubated till the resting phase. Now cut the culture in a small piece about 4 mm from agar slant by straight loop and transfer to the cryo vial, which is containing 10% glycerol or 5% DMSO. So this freezing is something which is very different from lifelization. Yeah, here you are only freezing it. And what you have used, you have used a cryoprotectant. Now, what kind of cryoprotectant you want to choose? Either you are choosing a penetrating one or you are choosing a non-penetrating one. So you are using 10% glycerol, 5% DMSO, which is a penetrating uh, cryoprotectant. Tighten the cap properly and arrange in the box and keep it in minus 20 and minus 80 degrees centigrade. So you have to use very small cryovials you can use and you can perform. And this is very comfortable for most of the laboratories and they do this technique and we also have used to do it uh, two three years back so that is the technique so we usually maintain it in both ways that is the through this uh, freezing preservation by glycerol or dms and also by continuous culture transfer that is another technique which we do where we have we feel that these isolates are repeatedly required so those are continuously transferred or maintained. Tighten the cap properly and arrange them in a box. So you have to label them always so that you don't mix the um, between the isolates. Now, reviving of fungus uh, from these is keep the vial at 35 degrees centigrade for immediate thawing. After, suppose you have put it in glycerol and you want to now thaw it. You want to revive that fungus, you needed it. So we keep the vial at 35 degrees centigrade for immediate thawing in water bath till all ice crystal dissolves. So, but it should not be the water bath, it should be 35 degrees centigrade only. It should not be more than that. Now take a look full of culture from vial and inoculate on preferred medium. So do not leave any component, take the entire culture and inoculate on the preferred medium. 
Now coming to the freeze drying or freeze drying uh, drying method that is where you are having freezing come drying that is freezing at minus 20 to minus 80 and drying by the by use of a vacuum equipment which creates a very uh, high vacuum uh, so there is uh, and the temperature still reduces so it is lifelization technique. So lifelization of freeze drying a form of permanent preservation it is not appropriate for all fungi. So we cannot keep on doing lifelization for each and every fungus and it is again very sensitive technique and you have to be very careful when you're performing it it can be done for yeast it can be done for some of the molds but for not all not for all the technique is used primarily with species that form numerous relatively small propagules and this procedure is the preservation method of choice for many spore forming fungi that produce large number of spores 10 micron or less in diameter the larger spores tend to collapse during the graphalization process and the structural damage caused is not reversible by hydration. So you have, you should have those uh, fungi which are having spores. I think those uh, some of the melanized fungi which are having very big spores, they cannot be used for lyophilization. You can use lyophilization for those fungi which are having spores, uh, but they are of small size and uh, small size spores. Two large spores again they will collapse due to the lyophilization process and there will be structural damage and you cannot revive them thus each ampule initially must contain many viable spores so you should take care that your the ampule should be having a lot of spores so that if you lose any spores the viability is lost so that is another very important aspect that you have to cover now what are the equipments and chemicals for lyophilization high quality mechanical vacuum pump is required an adverse two-stage pump is required, vacuum gauge, vacuum manifold, oxygen gas torch, where you are trying to actually uh, close or seal some of the tubes, glass tubes, oxygen supply, lyophilization ampules, cotton for plugging the tubes, pasture pipettes, sterile skimmed milk, permanent ink suitable for writing on glass and vacuum tester. So lyophilization process for this, you have an agar slant with medium that supports good growth and sporulation is inoculated so, so you have to prefer those media where you are thinking the fungus will sporulate better and it varies from different species and genera so you have to preferably choose to select or choose those medium where you are expecting very good sporulation of that particular fungus five or more lyophilization tubes are sterilized so you pre-sterilize the lyophilization tubes and label them about 1.5 to 2 ml of 10 percent skimmed milk 5% bovine serum albumin is added to an agar slant. Spores are suspended in the menstruum. This is the sterile menstruum that we are using. That is 10% skimmed milk with 5% BSA by gently scraping the agar surface with a pasture pipette or a glass pipette or a pasture pipette. Then approximately 200 microliter of the spore suspension is added to each of the several lyophilization tubes. So now from that uh, medium, you have taken small amounts 200 microliter of the suspension you have added to each of the lyophilization tubes now the tubes are plugged loosely with cotton and are kept at minus 20 to minus 80 degrees centigrade so you plug them with cotton and you keep them at minus 20 to minus 80 degrees centigrade and this you have to keep for overnight you have to keep overnight because you want to freeze them very well you don't want very quick freezing. You don't want them to freeze at very low temperature because the more the ice crystals and there is a lot of hydration once you keep it at the room temperature. Switch on the manifold, that is the lyophilizer, uh, the manifold and transfer the ampules when the temperature remains stable between 40 and 50 degrees centigrade. So your machine that is vacuum pump temperature should be somewhere 40 to minus 50, minus 40 to minus 50 degrees centigrade when it has reached that stable uh, temperature you actually um, put your ampules okay and uh, a vacuum is applied to the system till powder is formed primary drying now primary construction is done to form canal of 1 mm diameter so ampules are fixed in the manifold for secondary drying so you have finished primary drying a vacuum is applied to the system till powder is formed this is primary drying then primary constriction is done to form canal of 1 mm diameter. So ampules are now fixed in the manifold again for secondary drying. After two to three hours, check vacuum by vacuum tester. 
the ampules are then sealed under vacuum using a glass uh, using a gas oxygen torch so there are several torches that are available which can be seen when if you have a lyophilization equipment you can see the torch that they usually provide with that so uh, there are also uh, some uh, you can have elongated tubes or you can have some small wires which have got the cork which also you can fix the cork also so vacuum must be checked again to ensure leakage or breakage. Finished lyophilization ampules are stored in numbered plastic boxes or sealed plastic bags in a 4 degree centigrade refrigerator. The purity and viability of preparation in one lyophilization vial should be checked one to two weeks after preservation. So you have to have uh, with multiple, the um, once you have taken from the medium, the same growth is put in at least four or five tubes. So you pick up after one to two weeks, you pick up one uh, vial and you try to revive that vial. So if you are seeing the viability can be roughly categorized. So viability through lyophilization is also categorized into poor, moderate and good. Poor lyophilization viability is when you get only 10 to 15 colonies after you, after you have put it from that ampule, one ampule what you are testing. Because you have chosen 200 microliter of the fluid of the uh, skimmed milk you have added mixed with the skimmed milk and you added 200 microliter of this into the uh, vial so one vial is having 200 microliter and it is preferred for the sporulating organisms and those sporulating organisms where the spore size is lower or the smaller spore sizes and when you're trying to revive if you are getting 10 to 15 colonies it is considered as poor viability if you get 50 to 100 colonies it is expected as a moderate viability and if you're getting around 100 to 1000 colonies it is considered as a very good or it's considered as a good viability so last is the liquid nitrogen so it is the easiest method that you can do but the problem is with the keeping the nitro liquid nitrogen in your laboratory so storage in liquid nitrogen is an effective way to preserve uh, many if not most organisms including those that cannot be lyophilized so the ones which are having larger spores uh, so tough molds you can all uh, you can um, actually you can preserve through, through liquid nitrogen it costs somewhat more than lyophilization however because liquid nitrogen must be replenished every few days if you have your liquid nitrogen will be over so you need to maintain them you require other things also the person who is handling requires all kinds of uh, protective gloves and uh, foot covers so and every time you are using it has to be kept safely in a separate room and um, you have to take all the precautions and storage methods they stop cell division completely and totally arrest metabolism while still retaining viability so this is best because it immediately stops the cell division and this is a very good storage method immediately the organism is crystallized and uh, there is uh, arrested metabolism but the viability is maintained the major advantage of liquid nitrogen include prevention of increased genetic variability of distributed distributed culture stocks time saving reduced labor prevention of culture loss from contamination and increased assurance of long-term availability of cultures so this is what is a liquid nitrogen you'd usually do for fungal cultures that do not sporulate or the primary mycelia that grow deep into the agar sterilized 2 ml screw cap polypropylene vials are filled with 0 0.5 to 1 ml sterile 10 percent glycerol plug 4 mm in diameter are cut from vigorously growing cultures using a sterilized plastic straw several plugs are placed in the vial the cap is tightened and the tube is placed directly into the vapor phase that is temperature is minus 170 degrees centigrade of a liquid nitrogen tank so you have liquid nitrogen tank where you can place you can tie it with a thread and you can put it in the cylinder so you have to use a tube and in that you are using this uh, you put this um, this uh, fungus okay with uh, glycerol and you just dip this tube with a thread uh, so that the thread is hanging outside you are tying the tube with this thread and put put it into the liquid nitrogen tank at minus 120 degrees centigrade so very carefully you have to write before performing this technique so that once you take it out you know uh, you don't have to manipulate it much and you can keep it for preserving at minus 20. So that is what you have to do. So these were the overall preservation techniques that I tried to cover. There are still more literatures available. What I could find and what we we are doing here, 
it is what we have told you uh, our lyophilization we are trying um, but we are not getting very good results with all fungi so i did not uh, show you our images but yes uh, our continuous cultures glycerol stocks and our uh, distilled water stocks they do function well but uh, sand we are not using this technique we are planning again for the liquid nitrogen but their supplies are limited so liquid nitrogen is something that we can try the only thing is how to replenish the liquid nitrogen is a challenge many times but it is the easiest method because for again for life laser there are a lot of resources that you have to keep on putting it and getting those and you have to maintain the vacuum pump you have to fill the oil you have to check many many things you have to check when you're using a life laser so there are challenges in preserving the fungus, but if we do not preserve these fungi, it is very difficult for us to maintain our controls and very good isolates, which we really want to work on will be lost because fungus is something that is again lost easily and it, there are high chances of contamination. So thank you. This was about the preservation of the fungus. So we will have a break of five minutes and then we will start the next session. We have a video, I think. So we will first play the video of the instruments that are there with us and then we will show you, then we will have a break of five minutes and I will switch to the next topic. So first we are going to play the video. Break time, lie, lie, equipment. So this is a small video of the equipment that we are having here. Uh, so we will try to show you this uh, video and um, we are not telling you in detail about the specifications and uh, the company and everything, every aspect of this, because we have covered most of these equipments while we are performing say, fungal serology we, we, and we have tried to show, demonstrate you some routine techniques and also AFST, we have demonstrated how these equipments function. So we are just trying to again uh, give you a complete overview. Some equipments, you your centers, you might be having much better equipments what we are showing from uh, than this. So our molecular setup is still growing. It has not been completely established specifically for mycology. So we have limited uh, equipments in that. So we will show you that little bit of overview of what you require. So for routine mycology, you require incubators, you require water baths, you require uh, a lot of other uh, refrigerators, deep freezers, because you are trying to stock, preserve this uh, fungi. So these are your routine requirements. Um, you require some refrigerators for preserving your routine media. So these are fundamentals, what you require. Then you go ahead with AFST, antifungal susceptibility testing. So for antifungal susceptibility testing, you have seen, we require a lot of pipettes. You have seen how the pipettes were actually utilized and they were being handled. So the handling of the pipettes you've seen during fungal serology, during various techniques. So we're not repeating that because with each and everything, there is a entire manual which needs to be covered. So we are not going to cover the entire handling manual. We just are trying to cover. So if for AFST, you require uh, the pipettes, appropriate uh, uni uh, single channel pipette, multi channel pipettes, then you require the pump uh, filtration pump, mm -hmm. then you require an incubator. So there are uh, syringe filters. So these are small, small things which you require uh, consumables also for performing the AFST. And weighing machine is also required, which have demonstrated how we are using a weighing machine. So for uh, antifungal susceptibility testing, you have to use a milligram a weighing machine. It is a milligram weighing machine where the quantity that is measured is point uh, after the point, there will be four zeros, point zero 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 one. So that is how you have to use. Usually in many of the weighing machines that we are using, uh, is, it has up to three zeros, point zero zero one, point zero one. So you have to use a milligram weighing machine. You have to be very careful when you're selecting a weighing machine for the antifungal susceptibility testing. And then we have demonstrated spectrophotometry in case of antifungal susceptibility testing, how you have to use, it is required. 
So these are some of the things. In, in case of fungal serology, you have seen the use of the hood, the uh, biosafety cabinet, how it is used. And if there are several vortex and centrifuge machines, water bath. We also have the kinetic ELISA reader. There are ELISA readers, which are uh, this what we are using for the um, be, for the galactomannan assay and for the uh, beta D glucan. Particularly for beta D glucan, what you require is a kinetic ELISA reader because for every minute you have to have a reading. So we have a summary of entire reading to get our results. So kinetic ELISA reader is what you specifically require for the um, beta D glucan testing, that is for the fungital. So these are some equipments which you require for the uh, fungal serology. So we can start the video now. This video has been prepared with uh, all the efforts of our young faculty and our uh, technical trainers. And so here I want to uh, name Dr. Anand Mori and Dr. Arati for having contributed sufficiently. And they are very active members and they take care of all these equipments. So the equipments have to be labeled well, their source have to be mentioned. To maintain the downtime registers, you have to have SOPs, you, everything has to be in place. So this all cannot be taught, but yes, and you all know this and it has to be just in place all the manuals the engineers number so everything has to be maintained well we start the video Incubator is a vital laboratory equipment which is very much necessary for providing and maintaining the ideal temperature for the growth of different fungal species and they are isolated from the inoculated samples from the culture tubes and the plates. To maintain the incubator, the inside of the incubator should be cleaned by an appropriate disinfectant Mostly, 70% ethanol is used regularly. Ultimately, to prevent the organism contamination and the temperature fluctuation must be monitored, maintained and noted down on a regular basis. Here we know that different fungus and their species require different set of temperature for their growth and development. Such as, temperature of 37 degrees centigrade is favorable for the growth of yeast and yeast-like organism. So here, incubator of 37 degree centigrade is required. Whereas the incubator with 25 degree centigrade is ideal for the cultivation and culturing of molds such as dermatophytes, dimorphic fungus and the mucus species. This is the vacuum pump which you had seen how we have used yesterday for uh, filtration for performing the antifungal susceptibility testing. So you can have the uh, spectrophotometer is an analytic instrument used to con you can have a vacuum pump uh, which is uh, can be provided by different uh, methods. We have Tarsus vacuum pump also. Uh, actually, this is vacuum pump and to that we have a uh, container which is, can be autoclaved. What we are showing you right now, this is a non autoclavable use and throw uh, from high medium. So this one you can use or else what you can use is this cost somewhere around uh, 9000 rupees for how many do we get? It is somewhere around uh, 20, uh, 12 or 14, 12 to 14 actually are such vacuum pumps which come in 9000 rupees. We also have the Tarsons um, 500 uh, ml filtration uh, uh, tubes, one on the above and uh, bottom. So you have to buy membranes in those cases. So in here actually membrane, it is coming with the membrane fitted. So you don't have to waste money on buying the membranes. Again, cost. Membrane cost also is a cost that add, gets added up. So Tarsons filtration uh, assembly is available. So that is autoclavable, which you can autoclave. But the central membrane you have to purchase and you have to fix it in that assembly and then you have to sterilize it. Once you have sterilized, only then you have to start the machine or use it for the filtration method. So this is a oil-free uh, vacuum pump. Uh, there are different uh, makes and uh, uh, machines are available. So uh, we are using uh, this one and this is actually very nicely functioning for AFST. You can also use uh, such oil free pumps.
Spectrophotometer is an analytic instrument used to quantitatively measure the intensity of the light passing through the sample generally to detect the concentration of the solution. Here handling the cuvettes carefully to avoid breakage and avoid spillage of the solution on the outer side of the cuvette. Ensure that transparent side of the cuvettes are in the optical part. Always keep the device clean and keep the sample clean. Gel dock or gel image system is an equipment widely used for molecular biology for the purpose for the imaging and documentation of nucleic acid and protein suspended in the gel. Gel dock is connected with a system. Make sure you clean all the equipment surfaces, tables and do not dispose or keep the gel in the gel dock for a very longer time. After working, make sure you have to shut down the UV light or the other lighting in the gel images. Electrophoresis gel system. For separation of nucleic acid, protein of interest, you will need to run your samples through a gel apparatus which contains a cathode on one end, anode on the other and the platform that holds a porous gel in the middle of an appropriate buffer is added to create a charge gradient upon the application of electric current. There are two main types of gel electrophoresis system. First one is the horizontal and second one is vertical. There must be some precautions that one must take while running the gel in the gel apparatus. All here the ETBR which is a very hazardous carcinogenic chemical. So handling of ETBR should be uh, carefully done. Second, there must be make sure that all the power supply, switches, lights and floating output circuit is functioning properly and there should be a regular monitoring of the buffer tanks that if there is any leakages or uh, any kind of spillage. PCR or thermocycler is a vital equipment which is designed to amplify and make copies of the DNA. It has a great importance in the medical field as it detects the presence or absence of DNA as well as it can detect quantitatively the presence of the DNA in this sample. The DNA copies which are isolated by using the PCR can be used in gel electrophoresis as well as in further techniques. Nanodrop spectrophotometer used to measure nucleic acid concentration in 1 microliter of sample as well as it also detects the purity of your nucleic acid. Basically this is accomplished by placing the sample directly on the top of the detection surface and creating a surface tension between the column and the optical fiber. While practicing the nanodrop spectrophotometer, a good practice guidelines must be followed. All measurements require calibration to a blank. Use a sample of sufficient concentration. Ensure the read head are clean. Both the upper and lower read heads must be cleaned regularly with the wipes and read each sample only once, one at a time. Centrifuge is a very vital equipment which is present in all the laboratory setup. This is an equipment which is used to separate particles suspended in a liquid. According to the particle size, density, viscosity and the rotor speed, the particles are separated. There are some safety precautions that one should take when working with a centrifuge. First is balance the centrifuge. Running an unbalanced centrifuge may cause damage. So first step is to balance the centrifuge. Do not open the lid while the rotor is moving and ensure all sample tubes are evenly filled before placing the tubes. Eliza reader or plate reader is designed to determine the presence of any biological, chemical or physical presence in the microtiter plate. It reads the optical density of the samples which are inoculated in the microtiter plate. Mm -hmm. 
Biosafety cabinet is an equipment to provide the sterilized condition against the biohazardous or infectious agent, as well as it helps to maintain the quality control. It uses HEPA filters to filter out all the pathogenic biological agents from the workspace environment. Here are some precautions that must be taken while working on Biosafety Cabinet 2. Never have the UV light on when working at the cabinet. Always turn off the UV after 10 minutes before you start your work. Turn on all the blowers and cabinet light while working and do not block the vents with your arms or other materials. Always clean the bench regularly with disinfectant, usually 70% ethanol and take precautions to achieve minimum, minimum skin contact with the biohazardous samples or infectious agents. So these are some of the equipments again which are uh, available with all the centers and all the uh, resource limited settings also small incubator water bath so all these things are required uh, for uh, routine uh, usage in the mycology laboratory also for fungal serology for afst you require all these things so you have to maintain all the equipments uh, label them correctly have your manuals updated in the company when it gives you any manual Please do keep them in order <clears throat> so that you are trying to uh, monitor and maintain them very well. There is a quick maintenance. Freeze drying or lyophilizer. Basically, lyophilizer executes water removal process typically used to preserve the microorganism for a very longer period of time. Here, do not use, if it is not installed correctly, corrosive substance cannot be lyophilized, do not place potentially dangerous objects such as liquid near the lyophilizer, any toxic contaminant, pathogen or radioactive substances must be placed in a separated area, minus 20 or minus 80 degree centigrade deep freezers are used in research medical and the clinical applications it is used for the storage of the samples and organisms that requires ultra low storage temperature make sure that the door of deep freezers must be closed properly otherwise there will be a temperature fluctuations and samples as well as microorganisms must be placed properly inside the deep freezers. So this was a, a short video of the equipments that are available with us and some are again in pipeline. So we are still continuing some equipments which need to come. So uh, fundamental things that are required for each and every test have been demonstrated during the process of performing. So I hope this information will be helpful and most of it is already known to all the participants I know. So we will have a break of five minutes and then we will continue to the next topic which is publishing new fungal species.